text this morning is from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, starting at verse 1. These are the words of God. But of the times and seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. For you yourselves know perfectly that, perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them, as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. Ye are all children of light, and the children of the day. We are not of the night, nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that be drunken are drunken in the night. But let us, who are of the day, be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for an helmet, the hope of salvation. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that, whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Wherefore, comfort yourselves together, and edify one another, even as, ye also, even as also ye do. Father in heaven, we thank you for this text. I pray that you'd be with us as we work through it. I pray that your spirit would teach and instruct and encourage and establish us. And we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. So we are returning to our series through the book of 1 Thessalonians, picking up at the beginning of chapter 5. As we work through this next portion of Paul's letter to the Thessalonians, we want to continue to hold the various elements of the last things. Eschatology, uh, eschatology is the study of the last things, and there's two senses of the word eschatology. Uh, eschatology can refer to the final judgment, heaven and hell, the sheep and goats before the throne of God, the last things in that sense. But eschatology also, and more frequently, applies to your view of what the Bible teaches about the end of human history in the run-up to the final coming of Jesus Christ. So we're, we're going to be uh, here in 1 Thessalonians. We're going to continue to talk about eschatological things. And also, when we get to 2 Thessalonians in the fairly near future, when we get to chapter 2, it'll be the same thing there. We want, to hold, we want to hold all these things together loosely in the palm of our hand. After we have all the pieces on the workbench in, in front of us, especially after 2 Thessalonians 2, we will then seek to look at how they all relate to one another. For the moment, to help us keep everything straight in our minds, I'm going to begin referring to the end of all things as the final coming of Christ. And I'm doing that because popularly, most Christians speak of the second coming of Christ. So Christ in his incarnation, uh, was the, that was the first coming of the Christ. And then we talk about his coming at the end of the world as the second coming of Christ. But then if you start working through, oh, was, his, was the destruction of Jerusalem a coming of the Lord in judgment on Jerusalem? Was that, a, was that an appearance or was that the day of the Lord? Was that a coming? Well, if that was a coming of the Lord, then that's the second coming. Well, and the second coming is not the final coming. So just to keep things straight, I'm going to be talking about the end of the world coming of Christ as the final coming. And there, there are other comings in judgment, as we will see. So this is the budget for the fact that when Christ comes, whenever he comes in judgment, as he did with Jerus Jerusalem in 70 AD, that is a day of the Lord. So having said all this, at the same time, we should work through all of this in real humility. Not, we don't want to just hold things loosely in our hands so we can get all the pieces as we seek to assemble them uh, later on. But we should also hold them loosely because this is a difficult passage to understand. This is a difficult passage to understand the, the teachings of Paul in First and Second Thessalonians. We should remember that Augustine, one of the greatest minds in the history of the church, over 2,000 years, one of the greatest minds, said of 2 Thessalonians 2, quote, I frankly confess I do not know what he means. <laughs> so let that be running in the background. You can say, yeah, I know better than Augustine. So, so. so as we consider this passage, starting in verse 1, Paul had not had the opportunity to teach the Thessalonians everything that he had wanted to, but he had already covered this. So remember, he was only there for a handful of weeks, and then he had to leave. Uh, and he, he was frustrated that he hadn't been able to teach them everything that they needed to know. But he had covered this. He says, you know the times and the seasons. Th this is something I, I don't need to, 
I don't need to go into this, but of the times and seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you. That was something that we did cover. You know the times and seasons, verse 1. The day of the Lord, he says, the day of the Lord would be sudden and unexpected, like a thief in the night. Verse 2. Now, you should be aware that throughout Scripture, that phrase, the day of the Lord, is commonly used throughout the Old Testament, is commonly used for any number of historical judgments. All right, it's a, so if you're reading through the Old Testament, the day of the Lord, when the, when the Lord visits his wrath on different cities or empires or pagan, um, pagan potentates, uh, the, the prophets commonly call that sort of visitation the day of the Lord. And, and Paul uses that phrase here. The day of the Lord is not necessarily the final coming. That's the, that's the point. Uh, just because it's the day of the Lord doesn't mean that the end of the world has arrived. There have been any number of uh, days of the Lord. When they're expecting peace and safety, they will, they will suddenly give birth to sudden destruction, verse 3. Uh, and that reminds you of what Peter says about Noah's, uh, Noah's flood. Noah's, uh, the judgment in, uh, with, uh, in Noah's day was a day of the, that was a day of the Lord. The judgment on Sodom and Gomorrah was a, a day of the Lord. So, and, and this day of the Lord is going to be no different. When they're, they're going on in their insolence, and they're going on uh, in their sleekness and their fatness, uh, they're expecting peace and safety, they will suddenly give birth to sudden destruction, verse 3. But their complacency was a moral darkness, not an intellectual one, verse 4. It's a moral darkness. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. In other words, he's not saying the day is not going to take, oh, the, that you're not going to be surprised by it because you're so smart. He's saying you're not going to be surprised by this day arriving like a thief in the night. You won't be surprised because you were ready, and you were ready because you were not living in darkness. You were not, you were not morally blinded. So, the, the, the darkness is not an intellectual IQ issue. It is what you see in Proverbs. Folly in Proverbs is a moral condition. The, uh, and in the Psalms, the fool is said in his heart, there is no God. A, a man can be a great fool, biblically speaking, but have intellectual RPM, can have a lot of uh, abilities intellectually, but still be foolish, still be living in darkness. So the, the, the believers in Thessalonica were children of the day, Paul says. They were children of light, and that is what would prevent the day from overtaking them like a thief. So verse four, verses 4 and 5. So because you're walking in the light, because you are standing upright, because you're confessing your sins, because you're worshiping the Lord, you're not going to be, you're not going to be overtaken. It's not going to be a thief in the night event for you. It is going to be a thief in the night event for them. So his exhortation is that they remain awake and sober. All right, be sober-minded, be awake, and be sober. Verse 6. Sleep and drunkenness belong to the night, not to the day. Verse 7. So people are asleep at night, people who get drunk get drunk at night, but I want you walking around like children of light. I want you to be walking around like it's noon. And that's a, that's a moral noon. All right? That's an upright noon. So those who are of the day should be sober and they should put on the, the helmet of the hope of salvation and the breastplate of faith and love. So they are, they are walking around in the day armed. They're walking in the daylight armed for battle. It's the church militant. It's not the church triumphant. It's not the church at rest. This is the church militant, prepared for collisions, prepared for confrontations. So the helmet of the hope of salvation and the breastplate of faith and love, verse 8. The reason for this preventative behavior is that God has not appointed them to wrath as he did the others, but rather to obtain salvation through Christ, verse 9. Now, if you look at verse 9, for God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain, obtain salvation. Just incidentally, that is a clear passage that shows the sovereignty of God in salvation. Why are these others lost? Why are they children of the night? Why are they going to go down? Because they were appointed to wrath. They were appointed to wrath. And Paul tells the Thessalonians that you're not in that 
position. You were not appointed to wrath, but you were appointed to obtain salvation. The reason you're saved is God called you. The reason you were saved is that God summoned you. Um, and God's summoning, God's call is efficacious, and when he summons you, you will come. So, you've not been appointed to wrath like these others, but rather to obtain salvation. Christ died for those believers who were already dead. Now remember, this is probably what occasioned some of the questions the Thessalonians had. Some of their number had already died since Paul, since Paul was there, and they were concerned about, uh, are, the, are the saints who died before, are the the members of our church who died, perhaps even in persecutions, these people, these people died, uh, what, uh, what happened to them? Are they going to be left out? Paul, remember, um, has said, no, they're actually going to precede you. Uh, we who are alive uh, are going to be caught up and meet the Lord in the air. Those who are asleep in Christ will go first. But he, he mentions them again. Christ died for those believers who were already dead, and for those who remained alive, he also died for them. They're not left out. They just come second. So that all of them would be enabled to live through him. Verse 10. These were to be words of comfort and edification, not words of speculation and confusion. Comfort and edification. That's, the, that's what he's aiming at. We ought not to be coming up with theories that divide Christians. We ought to be reading this in such a way that when we're done, the cash value that comes out is comfort, edification. We are built up. So there, these are to be words of comfort and edification, which Paul assumed that the Thessalonians would continue in. Verse 11. Now, let's, uh, with that in mind, let's get a few other pieces out on the workbench. Paul, I would say it's obvious here that Paul has the Thessalonians of the first century, people who lived and died 2,000 years ago, Paul wants them living in a state of high alert. Right? There, is, there are very few things um, that are uh, more obvious than the fact that if you read through the New Testament, the, the saints in the New Testament were, something, were expecting something big in their lifetimes. They were expecting th this is going to happen. This is all, you know, James says, the judge is at the door. Uh, the, Lord, the Lord is coming. The Lord is coming soon. The Lord is coming. Behold, I come quickly. So we, all through the New Testament, you've got this sense that it's on top of us. All right? we're, we're, living, uh, we're living in the end of the age, as Paul says in Corinthians. These things were written as an example uh, for us, Paul says, 2,000 years ago, that he's talking about the Jews in the wilderness, these things were written as an example for us upon whom the end of the ages has come. So he, they were living in a state of high alert. Paul wants the Thessalonians to be living in a state of high alert. They are to be awake morally, and they're to have their armor on. If they could read these words of his to them and not be looking out the window at what might be happening in their day, then that would, be, that would have been the result of them not paying very close attention. Paul is expecting them to know what he's talking about, the, the currents and the happenings, the, the things in the newspaper of his day. So the only way they could miss this note of urgency, the, this urgency throughout the New Testament, is something that every recipient of these letters, and particularly the Thessalonians, something's going to happen. All right, something's going to happen. It's right on top of us. That tone of urgency, that tone of urgency is very clear in this passage. All right, put your armor on, stay awake, you know, have somebody on watch. That, it's urgency. Now, just as I have argued in the past that the presence of the general resurrection the presence of the general resurrection of the dead is an indication that we're talking about the final coming. The general resurrection of the dead happens at the end of temporal human history, and then we enter the eternal state. All right? So the general resurrection, when we are all gathered to the Lord, when the dead are raised, when the graves are opened, that's an end of history event. The Anomaly, the extraordinary thing, was that God gave us an earnest payment, a down payment, on that final general resurrection in the resurrection of Jesus. So Jesus rose from the dead in the middle of history as sort of an earnest payment so that we would all know what is coming. 
So the way Jesus came back from the dead, his body went in the grave. Three days later, he comes back from the dead. That's what's going to happen to everybody at the end of history. But it hasn't happened yet. Okay, what happened to Jesus has not happened yet. That's going to happen at the final coming. And any passage that talks about the general resurrection of the dead is talking about the final coming. So also, here's another indicator, so also the presence of an any minute now vibe is an indication that we are talking about the events that run up to the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. So, I, um, I believe the well, I, I believe that all the books of the New Testament were written prior to 70 AD. Uh, some scholars believe that a handful of books are after that, but uh, I, I take the entire New Testament as, as having been completed before the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. And so consequently, in any passage that's talking about uh, when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, head for the tall grass. When you, when you see the Romans coming, it's time to get out of pray that you're... Uh, Pray that your flight not occur on the Sabbath. Well, because all the gas stations are closed on the Sabbath. Right? You, you, that's a, a, a condition in Palestine. In Palestine, where they observe the Sabbath, pray that your uh, flight not take uh, place on the Sabbath. Uh, pray that you not be uh, a pregnant woman or nursing when these things come down. That sort of, those sorts of urgent um, uh, warnings and Jesus saying this generation will not pass away until all these things have been fulfilled, that sort of thing is an indication that we're talking about the destruction of Jerusalem or the events that run up to the destruction of Jerusalem. Now, in these two letters to the Thessalonians, we have both elements weaving in and out with each other. We have both elements. We have references to the general resurrection of the dead, end of history, final coming, and we have references to the events of the first century. And the task, when we get everything out on the workbench, the, the task is to assemble those uh, images, those references, into a coherent picture, a coherent whole. Looking ahead to 2 Thessalonians 2, 6 and 7, you see something similar, another urgency passage, um, in that Paul tells the Thessalonians that he that restrains is currently restraining, and that is why the man of lawlessness has not yet appeared. All right, so the final coming is not going to happen until the man of lawlessness appears. And the man of lawlessness has not yet appeared because someone or something is currently holding it back. There's, there's one who restrains. And he's talking about that restraint being applied at, at that time in the first century. That is going on right then. So that's the setup. As the first century Christians were navigating their way through a very dark pagan century, they were warned by Paul against some very real perils in their day. All right, so they, they had um, the apostles and the pastors and the teachers in the church had practical pastoral problems that confronted them day to day, week to week, and they had to, they had to decide what to do about them. So formal emperor worship had begun under Augustus. So Jesus was born in the reign of Caesar Augustus. Julius Caesar was the first Caesar in fact, but he didn't take the title emperor because it was okay for him to be a dictator, but people didn't want him to have the title of dictator. It wasn't safe yet. So he was the first emperor, and then Augustus was the second emperor, and the second emperor in fact, and the first emperor in title. So there was the history of the Roman Republic, and when the Roman Republic came to an end, Julius was the one who established himself as the first of the emperors, in fact, and then Augustus was the first emperor in name. And Jesus was born in the reign of Caesar Augustus. Okay, now, in the reign of Caesar Augustus, emperor worship began, formal emperor worship, where the emperor was worshipped as a deity, as a god. That began under Caesar Augustus. Now, Caesar Augustus was enough of a decent human being to be embarrassed by it. Right? He, didn't, he didn't like it. It was one of those things for reasons of state. Uh, but he was, he was uh, embarrassed by it and didn't like it. And, and when people would fawn and flatter over him, he, he, uh, you know. But it was established. And Thessalonica 
where Paul is writing this letter, Thessalonica had a temple to the emperor. Right? Thessalonica had a temple to the emperor. So when you drove to church this morning, you did not have to drive by a temple to the president. You didn't have to drive by the presidential temple where a lot of your neighbors were going to worship and offer sacrifices. That was a practical, a very practical problem. How do I deal with, how, how do I deal with this? How do I respond to this? So Thessalonica had a temple to the emperor. And remember that the, these are written, these letters are written in the early 50s, okay? In AD 41, all right, so ten, about 10 years prior to the writing of 1 Thessalonians, in, in 1041, Caligula had ordered a statue of himself to be set up in the temple at Jerusalem, which was only forestalled because Caligula was murdered, okay? Now, and, and, and it was really touch and go, it was really touch and go, because Caligula ordered this statue of himself to be set up in the temple at Jerusalem, which would have set off a, uh, a war. Uh, it, it would have ignited a war. A Roman general was tasked with setting that statue up, and he got to the border of Israel, and a, and a, a delegation of Jews came, came out to remonstrate with him, you know, sort of along the lines of, are you crazy? You know, is this, are, do you really want to do this? Do you want a statue of Caligula in the temple at Jerusalem? Um, the Roman general who was ordered to do this had his wits about him. He knew what a bad idea it was. Okay. He knew what a bad idea it was, so he stopped where he was. He wrote a letter back to Rome to ask the emperor, are you sure about this? All right, you really want to do this? And he wrote, the letter went back to the emperor. The emperor wrote a letter uh, saying, of course I want to do this. Do, do what you're told, and sent that letter off. And then the emperor was assassinated, and a, letter was, a second letter was sent off to the Roman general saying, don't do it, don't do it. Okay, so there's two letters racing to the Roman general. The letter that, with the, with the information that Caligula had been assassinated, got to the general first, and disaster was averted. All right? But Caligula, just 10 years before Paul's writing this letter, Caligula had tried to set up not only an, an idol for himself, a statue of himself, because that had been happening all over the empire uh, since Augustus, but Caligula wanted to do it in the temple of God, in the, in the temple that had been uh, established in Jerusalem. And so that was only forestalled because Caligula was murdered. Now, to give you a sense also of the atmosphere of the times, in the forecourt of one of his homes, right, in the forecourt of one of Nero's palaces, Nero had a bronze statue of himself built, and the statue was 120 feet tall. All right? That was, a, so you go out to the Theophilus Tower, count 12 stories up, and that's what Nero had in the forecourt of his house. These people didn't have, um, well, they had a ego problems, but they didn't have any problems, they didn't have any problems themselves with their own ego. They, they were outsized conceited, arrogant, I will ascend to the sides of the north. They had arrogated to themselves divine honors. It began with Augustus, who was embarrassed by it, but by the time it got to Nero, there was no embarrassment at all about it. So Paul, when Paul's writing about this sort of thing, this is, this, this is the climate that he is operating within. Now, there were certain signs that indicated the pending destruction of Jerusalem, the day of the Lord, and that destruction, Paul says, that destruction was something that had to occur before there could be a final coming. So Jerusalem has to be taken out. The day of the Lord has to happen before there is a final coming. That final coming was, in Paul's view, he does talk about it in, in, Thessal in the letters to the Thessalonians, but it was like a very high and distant mountain range behind the mountain range that they were about to cross. So think, think of look at, looking at this cataclysmic set of events that was going to happen by 70 AD. That's the mountain range that we're, we're in the foothills of that mountain range. But the mountain range beyond that, the final coming, is something we can even see from here. So it's a far distant range, but the, 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 fi the end of the world is something that Paul is teaching on, he's talking to them about, but it's not imminent the way the destruction of Jerusalem is imminent. The Jewish war 
would fill up the sins of Israel. The Jew- Jewish war would fill up the sins of Israel. Matthew 23, 32. That time, when, when the Jewish war occurred, that began in 68. Um, so, so, so what happened in... Uh, there's, there's so many things here, but... Um, uh, the revolt against Rome happened in uh, 68 and was concluded in 70 A.D. And the, the length of the war was 42 months. You remember that the beast in Revelation, uh, the, the time of trial, the time of tribulation, is 42, 42 months. That's how long the Jewish war was. And the Bible tells us that that war, that revolt, was going to inaugurate the times of the Gentiles the times of the Gentiles, a period of time that would be eventually completed. Jesus says Jerusalem is going to be trampled on until the times of the Gentiles are completed, indicating that there's a period of time that, will, that has a beginning and an end. The beginning was 70 AD, and the end, I believe, is at the final coming or shortly before that. So I take that completion as being marked by the conversion of the Jews an event that has not yet happened in Romans 11:15. So, uh, when the when the Jewish nation returns to Christ, that will be the time when when they're grafted back into the olive tree. That will be when the times of the Gentiles will have been completed. This means that we in 2020 are still living in the times of the Gentiles. So you have a day of the Lord, the destruction of Jerusalem. Then you have this. Uh, this mountain range, then you have this long valley that we're living in, and then another mountain range because, that we would consider the end of the world. Now, how is this to be an encouragement? How is this to be an encouragement? The thing that is striking, you, you might, um, I was just chatting with someone before the service, the year 2020 is, uh, is sort of uh, God's... Um, food blender, you know, the, uh, what do you call those? KitchenAids. So God has thrown us all into his KitchenAid on the counter, thrown the big lump of dough called our complacent lives and, and turned it on. And chugga, 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 chugga. And that's, and, and we say, God, what are you doing? What are you doing? And he said, I'm making bread. <laughs> I'm, I'm making bread. This is how I do it. Uh, this, this period of time that we're in is a threshing floor. This is a time of winnowing. God shakes things up. And when God shakes things up, he is doing something wholesome and good. When God shakes things, as it says in Hebrews, he is doing it so that that which cannot be shaken may remain. What happens is over time, Christians, even Christians, get attached to things that can be shaken. We get attached to things. So, Augustine referred to earlier um, when uh, he wrote his great book, The City of God, um, after the barbarians from uh, the north of Europe sacked the city of Rome. City, uh, the, Rome was supposed to be the eternal city, and when barbarians came and, and sacked Rome, a lot of Christians in Rome thought it was the end, of, uh, this is the end of all, all things. This, this is the, how could this possibly happen? The, the gospel had gone out, the emperors had been converted. By this point, the uh, Roman Empire was formerly Christian. And then these heathen come down out of Europe and, and sack the place. And Augustine writes his book, The City of God, to show, to illustrate that God has bigger, grander, higher purposes than those things that we got mistakenly attached to. Right? So not only was Rome not the final state of affairs, not only was the, a converted Roman Empire the end of the world, but there have been multiple empires that have come and gone since that time. And, we, and then we get to ours, we get to our uh, time of peace and security, and we think like every other group of complacent Christians who have peace and security, we think, ah, this is it. And God says, nope, into the KitchenAid you go. Right? Time, to, time, to say, time to shake everything up because I want you to be attached to the things that remain, the things that cannot be shaken. I want you to have your focus on Christ. I don't want you to have your focus on those things that can burn up, 
those things that can be destroyed, those things that can be taken away. So, once a judgment, now remember, there are multiple judgments down through history. There are multiple days of the Lord. Then there's a final day of the Lord. The, the final coming, the final day of the Lord, that will happen. But there are days of the Lord. There are times of winnowing. There are times of threshing. There are times of shaking that God brings. And he brings it because he intends to save this world. And this is his way of doing it. It's not our way of saving the world. Our way of saving the world would, would be to uh, forego the mountain climbing entirely and just walk up a gentle slope forever and ever. We, we want, and in the sunshine, with pleasant grass under our feet and no real difficulties. We, we, want, we want to be patient Christians. Oh, Lord, teach me patience and let me learn it from books. <laughs> and God says, no, no, that's not how I do it. Once the judgment begins, once a shaking begins, once a time of turbulent turmoil begins, that is no time to prepare. That's not when you start. Uh, what, what we're saying, what Paul's saying here, is he wants you to be spiritual preppers. Not, uh, we're not talking about physical preppers. Fine, knock yourself out. But he does want everybody, <laughs> everything falls apart and, and all the non-preppers get together and say, do you guys know any preppers? <laughs> let's, let's go over to their house. Well, that's a different subject. You are supposed to be spiritual preppers. You're supposed to be spiritually ready, and you're supposed to be spiritually ready before the crisis hits. Once the judgment begins, that is no time to begin to prepare. The judgment might be temporal and historical, a day of the Lord, or it might be final. It might be the final coming. Either way, you want to be ready the same way. You want to be awake and with your armor on. You want to be up, standing watch. And the final things can overtake any of us at any time, as had already happened with some of the Thessalonians, right? So uh, this could be a temporal judgment that lands on us all. It could be an individual judgment when everyone here is mortal. Everyone here is going to come to a point where tomorrow... At this time tomorrow, you will be in heaven. Everyone here is in, in that position. So, and that had already happened to some of the Thessalonians. One of the Thessalonians who had already died was the first one to die. One of the people who read this letter when it first arrived at Thessal Thessalonica, he was the last one of that generation to die. One of you, uh, out, of, out of all the people who are gathered here, one of you is next, right? And one of you is going to be the last one of you is next, one of you is going to be the last, and all of us are called to be ready regardless of when that happens. So in any case, <coughs> in any case, the daylight is coming. <coughs> and so Paul's charge to us is to act as though the day had already come. So we are children of the day in an empire of night. We are children of the day in an empire of night. Christians are those who got up early, or we're expecting the dawn. And so we're to live as though the day has already arrived because we are children of the day. We are not to be ethically groggy for any reason. All right? We're not to be ethically groggy for any reason. You don't want to be among those who were appointed to wrath because that appointment will be kept. Those who are appointed to wrath will come to wrath. Those who are appointed to salvation will come to salvation. So rather, we should yearn to be among those who will obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, Paul says here, who died for us. And this is what brings us back to the everlasting center, Christ our Lord. Because he was not overcome by the night, it becomes possible for all those who have trusted him, trusted in him, to follow him and to do the same. Christ was a son of the day. Christ was born into a world of night, a world of darkness, and he lived perfectly as a son of the day. And then, because he rose from the dead, giving us a down payment on what's coming, and made it possible when he sent his Holy Spirit, uh, to pour his Holy Spirit out at Pentecost on his church, he made it possible for you to become sons and daughters of the day. He made it possible for you to imitate him and to walk after him. But it's not just imitation. 
It's also, um, he gives you the security to be able to do that. Because when you follow after him, if, if Christians were just imitators of Christ, they, everyone here imitates him imperfectly. Everyone here fails in our imitation. And so, and every time we fail, that's another thing, that, that's another invitation to a spanking. That's another invitation to judgment, every failure. And so in, in order to be able to walk after Christ, imitating him, you have to be set free first. And the way God, the way God sets you free, where, where it says here, obtain salvation, we, we have the hope of, of uh, we have the helmet of the hope of salvation, and we want to obtain that salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us. There are two aspects to this. One is the one aspect of this is the fact that Christ died to pay the penalty that you owed for the sins you've committed. Every sin you have committed, every sin you might be committing right now, if you're a child of God, every sin you have committed, every sin you're committing right this minute, and every sin you ever will commit has been paid for by the death of Jesus Christ on the cross. But there's a problem. God imputes, the death of Je- God imputes the death of Jesus to you as the payment for your sin. So in Galatians 2.20, Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live. So when Christ died, you died. When Christ died, you, you're a sinner, you're the sinner, you need to die. And so what God did is he made it possible for you, the sinner, the one who needs to die, to die in a way that has resurrection before it. So what God does is he, if you have sinned, you need to die. If you've sinned, you need to die, and so you will die. God has enabled, the, God has created a mechanism by which the death that you need to die as a sinner is a death that was joined to the death of Christ so that when he died, you died, and when he was buried, you were buried, and when he was raised from the dead, you were raised from the dead, and when he ascended into heaven, you ascended into heaven. That is what it means when Paul says, obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ who died for us. Your penalty is paid. You pay it, but you pay it in Christ. You pay the penalty. I have been crucified with Christ. In Romans 6, it says, as many of us as were baptized, were baptized into his death. So we share together in his death. In Ephesians, there's a compound word that uh, uh, the... Our word is ko, a prefix ko. In Greek, it's soon. So there, Paul talks about believers being co-crucified, co-buried, co-resurrected. So when Christ was crucified, Christ, Christ did not die so that you might live. That's shorthand. That's fine. Christ died so that you might die. He was buried so that you might be buried. He rose so you might, ro- so you might rise. And he ascended into heaven so you might ascend into heaven. Christ was crucified, buried, rose, and ascended so that you could accompany him in him. And everything that you needed to do, die, you have done in him. So that's what it means when it says Christ died for our sins. But there's another component to this. And that is, not only do you need to pay for the sins, what, what do you owe God? Well, you owe God the penalty for having sinned. But you also owed God a righteous life that you didn't live because you were busy sinning. So you owe the penalty for having sinned, but you also owe him a clean, righteous, upright life. The Bible teaches that that too is imputed to us. Christ lived that life. There's been one Christian. There's been one perfect Christian life. Jesus lived it, and he lived it for you. So you, he paid the penalty for your sins, but he also lived the Christian life that you needed to live. And so it, this is called the imputation of the act of obedience of Christ. When Christ obeyed his mother, you obeyed your mother. When Christ obeyed his Father in heaven, you obeyed your Father in heaven. When Christ resisted temptation in the wilderness, you resisted temptation. And all of that is given to you. All of it is bestowed on you. And so what that does, and that's what our justification is, the imputation of the act of obedience of Christ and the imputation of the, what theologians call the passive obedience of Christ, not that it was passive, but the passion on the cross. So the imputation of the way Christ lived his life and the imputation of how Christ died both of those things that Jesus did, which encompass all of his life, that, in, 
They encompass everything about his incarnation. Those things are given to everyone who appropriates them by faith. So when you appropriate those things by faith, God looks at you, and when, God, when you come to pray, when you get on your knees to pray, when God looks at you, he sees perfection. And what does that do? That sets you free. And this can be misunderstood and distorted, and many people have tried to do it. But when God imputes perfection to you, that sets you free to be imperfect. Right? Now, how, how, does that, how is that distorted? Well, it's sin that grace may abound. Well, that, yeah. How can, but Paul says, how can we who died to sin still live in it? No, that, that's, you're reasoning wrongly. What it, what it means is that because perfection is imputed to you, when God looks at you, he sees the perfections of Jesus Christ, which is what you mean when you say, in Jesus' name, amen. That's, that's what you're saying when you conclude your prayers in Jesus' name. You're saying, God, you have no basis for listening to me at all unless Jesus lived a perfect, sinless life, and unless he died on the cross, I, I couldn't talk to you. I couldn't approach you, but because he did those things and they're imputed to me, I can talk to you, and I'm doing it in Jesus' name, clothed in his righteousness. Now, what that, that's justification, and your justification is perfect because Jesus is perfect. And that means that we've got all kinds of Christians here, right? We've got new Christians, old Christians. We've got Christians who are staggering around and Christians who have been upright for years. We've got raggedy Christians, and we've got uh, buttoned-up Christians. We've got all kinds of Christians here, right? Every one of you... Your justification is identical. Everyone, with, reg with regard to your justification, you are all equally perfect. It's not the case that some of you have a justification that's in tatters, and some of you have a shiny justification. You all, you're the saints of God. You all have the same justification, the righteousness of Jesus Christ imputed to you. Now, what I'm talking about, where you're learning to imitate and walk after God and follow him, that's your sanctification. That is how you do Monday and Tuesday. And, and, when, and some people's sanctification is in better shape than other people's sanctification. Some people struggle, and some people are doing well. Some people are growing and thriving, and some people are, are having more difficulty. Your sanctification, your sanctification is something that can be improved upon as the Holy Spirit works in your life. But one of the central things you must do in order to get your sanctification up and running is understanding your justification. One of the reasons why people falter in their sanctification is they, they leave the justification out. They, they're neglecting their justification. You have been cleansed. You've been set free so that you can follow after Jesus Christ and so that you're going to be able to put on the armor, even if you put on the armor imperfectly. Even if you walk around as a child of the day imperfectly, you're a child of the day and you're following after Jesus Christ and God receives your efforts at obeying him because it's all couched and offered up in the name of Jesus. That's how this works. So this is why Christians should be the most liberated people ever because you, uh, the, the burden has been taken off like uh, we just sang a hymn by John Bunyan, uh, what it is to be a pilgrim. When, when he comes to the cross and the burden rolls off of his back, that's his conversion. And the sense is buoyancy and relief and joy, and I've got to sing. I've got to, I've got to tell somebody how good this is because God has set us free. Now, you can be a child of the day, imperfections and all, warts and all, difficulties and all. You can be a child of the day provided you have appropriated the perfection of Jesus Christ by faith. If you have believed in Jesus, then you are perfect. If you have believed in Jesus, when God hears from you, he doesn't think, oh, there's that loser again. That's not how God receives you. God receives you with joy. God receive, he rejoices over you with singing. He wants you to pray to him. He wants you to fellowship with him. And you have been set free to do so, faults and all, stumbles and all. All the things that you confess at the beginning of the service when you confess your sins, those things God does not take into account when you come to him in the name of Jesus. And because he does not take them into account when you come to him in the name of Jesus, he helps you to take them into account. 
He helps you to figure out what you're doing. He helps you to understand why you're having this trouble in your family, why, why you're having this difficulty in your marriage, why, why you are struggling in, in bringing up uh, teenagers, why you are having all this difficulty at work. He helps you understand your life because you have surrendered your life. It's not your life. You've, you've given the whole thing up in the name of Jesus. And because God receives you on that basis, then you can, with no condemnation, no guilt, no, no uh, threats hanging over your head, God can then say, now, let's take a look at that. Let, let's take a look at this thing for which, under which, there, in Romans 8, it says, therefore, there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. You need to live your entire life imitating Jesus imperfectly under that banner. No condemnation. None. Zero. No condemnation. And because there's no condemnation, God's, God can then say to you, well, let's, uh, let's deal with this thing in your life, which, if you were outside of Christ, would have been condemnation. It would have been, it would have been condemnation apart from Christ. But you're in Christ, so let's have that out. Let's deal with that. Let's confess that sin. But you can confess your sin, and I'll conclude with this. In Hebrews, it says, let us approach the throne of grace with boldness, seeking mercy. Why do you approach the throne of grace? Well, you're seeking mercy, right? And when you seek mercy, how do you come? Well, our natural inclination would be to come crawling in on hands and knees, right? I'm seeking mercy. I prostrate on my face. I'm seeking mercy. But it says in Hebrews, we're to approach that throne of grace, seeking mercy, with boldness. And the only way, the only way you can follow Jesus Christ with boldness, the only way you can approach him with boldness is to do so in the name of Jesus. Our Father, our gracious God, we thank you for your kindness to us. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your, the gospel. We thank you for the day of the Lord, the, the different days of the Lord that you visited on us throughout human history. We thank you for the end of human history. We thank you for all of it. And Father, we pray that you would help us to understand it. And we, help you, we ask that you would help us to understand it in a way that enables us to encourage and edify one another as we put on the armor that Paul instructs us to put on. As we pray, as we pray this, we offer up the words that Jesus taught us to pray, saying, The words of institution for this supper are a performative act. They're not magic words that change the bread and wine into anything else, but yet, at the same time, we really do partake of the Lord Jesus by faith. That it is not a miracle can be seen in the fact that Paul argues that the same thing happens when someone participates in idolatrous worship. That person partakes with demons, Paul says. When a new president takes the oath of office, there's no magic there, and neither are his words a mere reminder. And yet, before he says those words on the appointed day, he is not the president. After he does, he is. It's a performative act. Before a man says certain words and puts a ring on a certain woman's fing finger, he's just her fiancé. Afterwards, he's a husband, and there was no magic done. It is a performative act. In the same way, when I hold up the bread and say, this is the body of Christ broken for you, and you receive it, you are partaking of Christ. If this were a black mass, you would be partaking of the devil. This is the, this is the power of the performative word. God created the heavens and the earth through the power of his word. We were created in his image, and God gave us the authority of words. We see this when our great-grandfather named the animals. Naming is far more than simply attaching reminders or post-it notes or labels. Naming is authoritative. And when this authoritative word is spoken and heard in faith, and the Spirit of God is present as he promised to be, all things in heaven and earth are united, and we are strengthened by grace in our pilgrimage as we partake of Christ. So come and welcome to Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for this table. We thank you for what it cost you and your Son and your Spirit to set this table for us. I pray that your spirit would be active here as we come in faith, strengthen our faith so that we can be blessed and edified and strengthened by it. We commit it all to you in the strong name of Jesus, and amen. The charge is this. Uh, live as children of the day. Live as though it were day. 
Uh, put on the armor that God tells you to put on. And as you do this, make sure that you have the cart and horse oriented correctly. In other words, the perfection of Jesus Christ goes before you and draws your Christian life after it. If you do it the other way, the cart doesn't go anywhere. If you're just going to get stuck. So let Christ be your Savior. Walk as though he's your Savior and follow close after him in his name under his perfections. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us, to him be the glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen.